Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Prod Circle session. And thanks for joining the call and for being interested in the politics of user research, which I will briefly and very, very uh, summarized um, approach. Uh, I will try to go through this in as much detail as possible. But obviously, if some of you work with research and if some of you work in research, you know that this is a huge topic that we could spend hours talking about it, but we won't today, but hopefully you'll get something out of the session by the end of it. So in terms of who am I, um, I've been working in UX research for the better part of the last decade. Currently, I'm working for uh, Vodafone. We're establishing a research practice there and finding new ways to deliver better products for our customers with cutting edge techniques. We also um, have quite a, a split in terms of our quantitative and qualitative practice, which we use actively as a mixed methods uh, framework for nearly every single project that we do. Previously, I've worked in travel industry in different companies consulting otherwise. So over the years, I've accumulated uh, some experience in terms of what people expect from research and the challenges that research faces even in very, very welcoming environments. And so to go right into it, um, definitely when talking about uh, UX research and the politics of user research in particular, it's important to have two ground definitions. One is what is research and the other one is what is politics. And obviously, depending on your own bias, you might have the impression that politics are primarily related to workplace politics, office politics, team politics, cultural politics. And that's all um, correct. And that's one of the reasons why today's uh, talk will have a little bit of a different structure. Because when you talk about research in particular, there is usually so many different types of research even conducted within the same environment that you need to be aware of. And whereas, for instance, UX research might be considered to be focusing on the digital experience for the company for the delivery of a better solution for the customers of that company. Uh, research is actually taking place on many different levels. And if you're working in-house, you know that there is a wealth of different teams and different practices that are working with research on different levels. So anything from customer feedback and anything that you get through surveys like NPS, ESAT, recorded calls, anything that comes through support, also with the behavioral part of the analytics, everything that you learn through commercial and market research as well, tends to be traditionally a little bit um, in the periphery of what UX research is traditionally considered of, but it's equally as important, equally as relevant, and especially for in-house practices, which I speak from experience in this case, it's very, very relevant to establish a good, strong, fruitful relationship with all of these different teams in the same environment. And that's one of the reasons why it's not method dependent, it's relationship dependent. And that's what we'll be exploring also a little bit today. So if you're talking about politics in general, there is obviously a wealth of different definitions, but uh, this one is cut and paste from Wikipedia, aka the source of all knowledge in today's times, um, which basically sets uh, politics as the group of activities associated with making decisions in groups or other forms of power relationships between individuals, such as distribution of resources or status. So what we learn from that is that politics is a, a group's issue, is something that happens within groups in between groups. And that's one of the reasons why it's very easy to fall into certain practices and certain assertions of uh, politics, particularly around a, a corporate environment as uh, us versus them, or having a specific uh, stance, having somebody having an agenda. And it doesn't have to be that way. And politics is certainly a lot more than that and both positive and negative. So we'll explore some of that. And definitely uh, one of the perspectives that I find more common, uh, especially when talking to other researchers and people who work in environments that might not be welcoming of research or might not be mature enough to know the value of research, is that they often feel like they are 
in the separate position. They are kept at bay or they are in a very difficult position because they have to face different influences, different decisions coming from different directions. And whereas you as a research in general is supposed to help validate and build the hypothesis that a business has in order to reach their customers more effectively, it can also work the other way where there are multiple forces and influences within the company that in in the assertion of a corporate uh, workplace politics might not be working towards furthering the customer's uh, benefit, but actually to be furthering their own benefit. And this is a very common conception to fall into. Now, research doesn't have to live there. And certainly after uh, working with teams and building research practices in different companies over the years, you often start starting from zero. Uh, one of the things that I found is that you, this is a conception that is very, very hard to displace once it's set into motion. And it starts with individual. It starts inside the individual as well. But basically, if we're talking about research at different levels, especially when it comes to politics, we have to um, talk about different um, aspects of it. And so it's not just one big group of influences. Let's talk about uh, the different aspects of politics and research, but from a group level. So start with micro level, meso level, and macro level, and see what you, each one of those is about. So on a micro level, researcher biases, participant biases, and cognitive biases are different aspects of something that might not be traditionally referred to as politics, but effectively it has the same the same output, that it might impact the outcome or the communication of that outcome to suit a particular either inclination, stance, preference, and uh, potentially um, benefit. And most of these are completely unconscious or completely um, outside of the of the awareness of the researcher or even anybody who participates in the research. But it's good to talk about those because the more aware that you are or the researchers are of this particular set of biases, the better prepared and better equipped they will be to fight against them. So one of the things that we need to keep in mind is definitely that we are very easily affected by <clears throat> insinuation. And it starts even with the way that we talk about things. So for example, um, multiple psychological res research over the, over the years has shown that different brand names and different ways of addressing things can result in a difference in your affect towards them. In particular, for instance, for brands, it's very common to rely on things like sound repetitions or having an alphanumeric um, brand name with higher numbers, for example, being more often selected. Basically, that means that the higher the number, the better it must be, right? You would think. Uh, and that's one of the reasons probably why, for example, S5, so let's say the Samsung S10 versus S9 versus S8, you would think there is an improvement. I'll leave it to you to really make that decision if there is an actual improvement that impacts your life in between those products, but the numbers indicate that they are better. And similarly, uh, even for example, having a foreign association or having a slightly different tone can impact the way that you think. And this is on a brand level, this is on an everyday life kind of aspect. Obviously, it's much more intense when you get to contact with data sets that might not suit, for example, a specific preference, and it's very easy to fall into specific types of researcher blindness um, at that point and ignore subconsciously, but ignore or um, deprecate certain data sets that might not validate a certain perception or a certain behavior that you are intending to prove. And so, one of the aspects that we also have to take into account is the bias with the participants. So obviously there is a different, it's a completely different environment for the users um, in being interviewed in a, in a specific constrained environment where they have to do something that the researcher tells them to do. They know that they're being observed. They want to succeed at their task. 
and that's not necessarily something that will give them um, a truth that will give you a truthful uh, response on the actual performance. So often in this case, for instance, social desirability bias in terms of them seeking a way to um, please or in their eyes be successful at the task that they're doing so that the researcher is actually satisfied in their perception is one of the major problems. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes studies that are open-ended or purely observational with uh, looser tasks are definitely more successful than specifically giving the participants a very specific, a very um, delineated and very specific task where they have to look for a very specific thing and they will be much more um, much more constrained that way. Same thing with anchoring bias where the first thing that they see is going to mark the reference of whatever they see next. So if they see the, the good prototype first and then in position B they see the bad prototype, you know that that's going to impact things. And the similar in the bad prototype in this case might well be um, rating much lower than the good prototype not because it's a bad prototype, but because it was coming after something that was perceived as better. Then in terms of the researcher um, as well, there are different aspects of the sampling bias, for instance. Is it representative enough? Is it inclusive enough? There are numerous um, aspects of it that need to be um, held into consideration. Also, that confirmation bias, as I was ref referring to, the transparency of the intent it's always important for the researcher to self-question. What is the sample size? What is the discussion guide to stick to the data? And especially for qualitative uh, studies, but not only, um, it's very important also to think historically. So it's very easy to say um, the last few studies or the last few interviews are slightly more interesting or slightly more fresher in, me in memory than older ones and the biggest problem with that is that it can quite clearly skew data. So the researcher can, um, at that point, just because the data hasn't been analyzed recently, um, think only of the last few uh, studies and the, and the preference that was expressed there. Same thing as well in terms of the task selection bias. So obviously, if you tell people uh, why don't you try and do this in our prototype? They'll know that it's possible. They'll know that there is something in there that allows them to do that. These are all data skew, uh, skewing uh, mechanisms that can impact the way that you analyze. And basically, this is not inherently political, but it is impacting also the way that you communicate and you select the data. And this is also part of the internal self-reflective uh, attitude that all researchers should have. And we'll look at the meso level. And this is really where <clears throat> um, it starts becoming more about the teams, about the environment, about the position of research in the broader spectrum of the, of the company. And it's at that point that it's very important to think of also uh, companies and clients, in this case, if you're working at, in a consultancy group, um, as active relationships, things that need to be nurtured. And if you're thinking about organizational politics, so when you refer to politics and you're thinking workplace politics, there are several definitions, but um, Ferris and um, a few of his um, working group um, defined it initially as a social influence process in which behavior is strategically designed to maximize short-term or long-term self-interest, which is either consistent with or at the expense of others' interest. So inherently, there is the idea of selfishness and there is the idea that it's deliberate. I would say that that's not always true. So a manager, for instance, may try to say, um, influence the a research project or even not be interested in research to protect his team. And it's a valid attitude in terms of his managerial policy. And that's one aspect that you need to be aware of as well, is that ultimately the goals that drive a specific individual or a specific group of individuals are something that if you want to establish a good relationship with, you need to acknowledge and also to a certain extent contribute to. 
and that's but that's part of the the problem as well is if you think of organizational politics or workplace politics um there are several studies showing that the main problem for the average worker in that situation is that the job satisfaction goes down organizational commitment goes down job involvement goes down plus it adds stress and of course um who would like to be in a place that they don't like to work that's also increasing the likelihood to um to quit and one of the biggest problems with organizational politics is really this perception as well that you have very little power in the middle of it you are not empowered to do that and certainly that's also a problem for research um we access lots of data good solid data that shows that the customers want the specific um, direction or specific feature to be implemented and then it goes through layers of decision and that idea either morphs into something else or doesn't necessarily uh, make it in the way that research for instance initially proposed it and that's one of the aspects as well that is very important to acknowledge is the fact that as researchers it's very difficult to see an idea that maintains its integrity from the the mind of the researcher in the form of a recommendation or a specific insight and then makes it all the way into the final product it's very empowering when that happens and it's definitely something to strive for um, but ultimately the role of research in a lot of ways is to advise to mitigate risk and to contribute to guide and um and direct up to a certain point but indirectly direct and directly anyway um the discussion around a specific product or a specific feature or a specific set of uh, implementations for the users and that means effectively that it's always bound to be a compromise but it's always always valuable and that's the key thing for research is for to acknowledge the value but not necessarily enter the conversation thinking this is the truth and this is what this is the final um the final objective that needs to be reached the final objective is in this sort of climate what would suit the the company to be delivered at that specific time in a way as close as possible as befits the customer and that's obviously something that involves a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion um but research is an essential part of that and so if you're thinking about different um, actors inside the companies and i'm sure that if you work in research you probably have those those types also defined um we definitely lead with different types of people in the company and obviously deal with different types of relationships in terms of what is their uh, relationship with uh research and of course you do have the loyalists like the PO that is gung ho for some user research and let's go and use a test everything gorilla doesn't matter we need that research in and that's great to have those champions around that's definitely something that um, creates enthusiasm and it's very and it's a very positive influence um but you also have other types like the haters people who don't know what research is or don't see any value in it um consider that the customers usually don't even know what they want so why asking them uh why would that be of benefit and then and i would say that a lot of companies do have this group in in quite a substantial number are the indifference what is ux research isn't this the same as market research how does this prove of any value to me and that's why one of the key aspects of research in any environment is evangelization and it's really establishing those relationships turning everybody into a loyalist in the long term is possible but it's not something that's going to happen 100 of the time especially in the big corporation it's not like something that would be true 100 of the time but you can create a sphere of influence and bring as many people into that into that part of um, awareness for ux research as possible it is is something incredibly important for maintaining and growing a ux research practice and so i mentioned the sphere of influence there's also different aspects that influence how to approach specific aspects of uh, research so basically 
It could be that the sphere of influence is your ability to bring others into the fold of making them aware of research and clamoring for it. And definitely UX maturity, uh, the model plays a huge role in that. But then also there are aspects with friction, for instance, which depend on the internal trust on how UX itself is seen within the company, on how the research team is seen within the company. And that also depends on the, t on the organizational structure. And even despite the fact that um, there might be a large buy-in for, for research, it doesn't mean that uh, the role is always going to be as emancipated as you might want to. So these are factors that can influence that. Then, of course, the topic sensitivity. Now, everybody has had experience of working on flagship projects or different or innovation-driven uh, projects that are quite sensitive. There are a lot of different concerns, legal, internal, to keep in mind. And definitely that's something that can also impact research and the better way of um, handling that is really to just focus on the data and be as representative as possible. It's always the, the way that the usefulness as well is impacting the way that the research project is perceived and definitely the priority and the impact for the user. These are all things that, for example, uh, me and my team use as well to prioritize our projects is to think of the user impact and the business value and really focus on those as ways to measure what a specific um, project's value, research project's value would be. And that being said, I mentioned before the qualitative approach and the fact that interviews, for instance, can be easily biased, but qualitative can also be, um, can be quite pervious to uh, bad analysis. So obviously everybody remembers Cambridge Analytica in different cases where data was used with manifestly unethical um, purposes, um, privacy and um, ethical handling of data is more than ever a discussion that we need to have. And it's definitely one of the things that also influences the way that the data can be perceived. I want to buy swaps on mortgage bonds, a credit default swap that will pay off if the underlying bond fails. You want to bet against the housing market? Yes. Why? Those bonds only fail if millions of Americans don't pay their mortgages. That's never happened in history. If you'll excuse me, Dr. Berry, it seems like a foolish investment. Well, based on prevailing sentiment of the market, and banks, and popular culture, yes, it's a foolish investment, but uh, everyone's wrong. <laughs> uh, watch that movie, This is the Big Short. And it's fundamentally a movie about a group of uh, financiers and investors that betted against the American economy, particularly on the mortgage and real estate market. Um, at a time when that was considered very stable, but eventually it collapsed into what became known as the 2008 um, economic crisis. And the way that they did this was by overcoming waves and waves of people telling them that it was never going to happen and just sticking to the data and just maintaining the perception and a clear analysis as they were going along with their plan. And this is very, very true for any type of research. But one of the things that we also have to keep in mind is the fact that research is supposed to aid in building something and could be just to inform a strategy. So you build that strategy, but also in terms of product development, for instance, it's not good to just provide pieces of research that can give, that can inform a little part of that product or that strategy, but to provide an overview and to give an impression of what is the, the final objective, what is the actual thing that the customer wants. And this has got a lot of connections to the way that research, for instance, is integrated in agile environments and in the delivery uh, systems. But definitely being in those kinds of processes means that uh, research can shape whatever is provided at any one given point into a vision, to a broader, longer term vision. And definitely that's one of the things that um, 
that affects a lot of UX uh, designers, researchers, practitioners, um, is the fact that their voices might not be heard quite as clearly as they would want to. That they feel that they have to fight against the culture or be assimilated. And again, going back to the us versus them, it's very important not to fall into those kinds of syndromes. So some of the classic research syndromes, for instance, is the syndrome of over-researching. So you, you're working on a project, you got your hypothesis, you interviewed 10, 20 participants, it's okay, but you're still not entirely convinced. So you run another round and another 10 or 20 participants, and you're still not completely sure whether the outcomes are valid. So you, you do another round. And every time that you do that, if you're in a position to do that, uh, you get diminishing returns. And over-researching is a thing, and it's definitely something that needs to also be um, acknowledged in terms of what do we know that we need to move ahead? And that's the, the start, that's the key point. Another very, very common uh, aspect is the, importer, the imposter syndrome. And it's very easy as a researcher to feel um, that you're not really providing any definitive answers on anything, or that everything that you're uh, looking into is, is temporary. It's not going to be a definitive, um, a definitive proposition. And that's one of the things that matters as well from a personal point of view is to always adopt the continuous learner mindset that a researcher or a designer or anybody who is working with data sets to recognize the transiency of what they're doing, transiency of the conclusions that they're reaching and not feeling like they are not qualified to give a definitive answer because obviously that's the whole point is it all approximations but continuously uh, getting closer and closer to the truth. Or another variation as well, in terms of another syndrome is why is everything always a fight in here? So uh, the researcher against the, the company or the researcher against the team or the research against the culture. Um, this is very, very common to feel that kind of friction. And it's very important not to go in with a Messiah complex in saying, I need to save this company or I need to save this. Um, because that's one of the things that will always generate that level of frustration and will be counterproductive. So it's always a case of looking into the collaboration more than the imposition, more than the authoritarian uh, view of something. Another common syndrome is the invisible researcher syndrome. Uh, who is a researcher? I don't know. He supports this team. Um, they might be doing great work, but it's not visible. It's not communicated more widely. And quite a few, uh, especially in bigger environments, you will have champions lurking in different corners. And it's important to get out there and to talk to them and to really have big share and tell events so that you can reach these audiences because you never know who will be uh, useful in pushing a certain topic or pushing a certain project along. The process improv syndrome, which is also very, very common, which is we have no research pro process other than either for intake or delivery, um, other than let's just uh, do some user testing at the end of every sprint. And although that's part of a process, it's very important for research to have a context and to have its own uh, process. What are the steps that you go to in starting a project? What are the different uh, points that you actually go through in actually uh, delivering said research? is all should be documented and defined. A lot of companies also say that they might be trying to fail early and experiment, but at the same time in certain climates, it's easy to fall in the political assertion that um, actually we don't want to experiment too much with the risk of failure because that will look bad or that wouldn't be quite as productive. And it's important to always bring to light that um, to be successful, you have to experiment and you have to be ready to fail, or at least um, to have something that is not the intended result, because the point is to learn and is to uh, improve in a, in a continuous way. And lastly, of course, there are many, many others, but the other one is the eluding bullseye problem syndrome, which is when you have a res uh, research requirement, you have something to go um, and research about, 
and something changes, the market changes, the product changes, the company changes. That's always um, basically a catch-all for the work that you that you have to do. And there are many others, but you get the picture with this. So there are a few ways, obviously, um, as I mentioned, the us versus them mentality is something that shouldn't be at any point in, anywhere near a conversation. It should be about sharing work plainly, openly, encoding it as little as possible. And by encoding it, I mean making it available in terms of presentations, in terms of, uh, in terms of databases, uh, but not hiding it, for instance, behind you know, hard to reach wikis and different, and different uh, resources in the company. And very, very quickly, because I know that I'm out of time, so I'll just run through this uh, in the last couple of minutes. Um, on a macro level, so I've talked quite in depth about the meso level, which is basically all about organizational structure, awareness. On a macro level, it's also wider topics that are social uh, in nature, but are very, very important to the way that you do research. So ethics and inclusiveness and market um, landscapes are important to be aware of and to incorporate actively in your research. So for instance, in terms of ethics, um, there are multiple issues with that. Again, hours could be spent just talking about that, but basically there are a few key principles. Um, for any sensitive area of study, make sure that you have proper guidance documents for the teams and for the participants as well. Consent forms that are comprehensive, data protection policies as well, and that you have a compulsory code of conduct. And for inclusiveness, also making sure that accessibility and ethnicity is not just the only thing that you're thinking about. It means empathy, means recognition for others, regardless of the background or physicality, and working towards a culture of flexibility and diversity and nurturing. That's the important thing when you're even um, integrating yourself into any environment. Same thing as with market landscapes. There's a lot of tendency for POs and and different actors in the business to look at the competitors and ask for competitive analysis left and right. This is what we need to, to learn is what, el what else are the competitors doing? And it's important to do that, but it's important to look forward, not just sideways. It's important to look at a vision for the future. And that starts with um, taking research data and building it into that kind of vision. So to conclude, um, just wanted to, to leave four key principles in terms of politics and different levels to summarize. So basically, it's important to identify the gaps where the research can provide a short-term benefit as a jumping point for future implementation, so suit the culture. Also critically is assess your own research methods and analysis methods, mitigate these potential biases. To build those collaborative relationships, don't make the culture fit you, but at the same time be critical and be open, but uh, with a view to improve things. And also be communicative, share often, and showcase the quick wins and there's no single silver bullet for any situation, but hopefully this will uh, be the start of something um, great in just in terms of attitude and towards the and towards the, the environment that you're working with. And that's it for me. Thank you very much.